Hello and welcome to the Active Inference Lab, to our first ever Applied Active Inference Symposium. Today it's June 21st, 2021, and we're very honored to be here with Professor Carl Friston and many of our lab participants. Just as a way of quick introduction, the Active Inference Lab is a nonprofit organization that is a participatory open science laboratory and we're working to curate and develop applications related to the active inference framework, something that hopefully we'll be going into a lot more in detail today. And this is a screenshot of our website. As far as the overview of the symposium, there are three organizational units in the lab, .edu, education, .coms, communication, and .tools. And each of these units are going to facilitate a 45 minute or so session, and we'll have a short break in between sessions. So in our weekly meetings over the past weeks for each organizational unit, we've been developing questions and getting excited about things that we wanted to talk to you about. As far as a few overarching themes that were kind of spoken to, um, really through the whole journey of our lab, but also across organizational units. The first theme is applying active inference across systems. Again, something that will come up probably in all sections. The idea of research debt, the idea that we don't want to be developing um, research frameworks that have a huge burden on those who are learning and applying and that especially early in the formalization of frameworks, it's extremely valuable to increase the accessibility so that we don't end up with major headaches and incompatibilities later on. Collective intelligence and the ways in which that is manifest across different systems. Transdisciplinary teams, projects, and communities, which are kind of like nested levels of organization, but transdisciplinarity is something that is necessary for the type of work that we're all interested in and also just modern challenges and opportunities for research and all that that means related to online and everything else and of course anything else that you have tumbling around and wanted to bring to the table thematically so there we are with our sort of lab overview and introduction Let's go to our first organizational unit, .edu. The goal of .edu is to scaffold and create a participatory and dynamic active inference body of knowledge, which we'll talk more about in a second. And our progress and actions this year have been to release a terms list, V1, which benefited greatly from your feedback. And also we're now updating the terms list to version two, which now includes five complete language translations and many references and citations for the terms. The way that we're approaching the development of the terms is by using approaches that place ontology and progressively more formalized versions of ontologies as kind of the backbone of an educational body of knowledge. So we started on the left side here with a terms list in the first quarter of 2021. And the ontology working group is like a train that's pushing to the right as they're learning ontology by doing and developing progressively stronger and stronger ways of relating the terms and the concepts that are essential for understanding active inference. And this will help us develop principled educational material that's also able to be translated rapidly. Alex, do you want to give a quick thought on where knowledge engineering comes into play? Yeah, thanks. Um, at this slide, uh, we are showing uh, this work with ontology, this system engineering approach that we are also using in the lab and considering possible uh, deliverables of uh, working on educational materials and creating them. Uh, we should have at some point of time textbooks and educational courses. 
uh, and actually maybe this lab is started from the idea that uh, textbook for active influence should be created also we see some connection that can be applied to organizational management for creating translations uh, to, to make it uh, multi-language uh, from the beginning and also we should uh, see for some domain specific use cases that we can understand in terms of uh, that ontology what we are going to create thanks alex so on to the questions section we're going to start off pretty broad here in the .edu. How do we go about determining the core ideas and terms for active inference? This will be the format of the question slides, Carl. So feel free to jump in. Right. I guess um, it will be structured around the, um, the, you know, the key ideas um, and essentially ingredients that underwrite the, um, the free energy principle and how that translates into active inference. So, you know, without thinking about it too deeply, you know, my mind just goes to what are the things, what are the basic ingredients that you need to explain to somebody um, what active inference is and, and why it works. And it normally starts off with the notion of a generative model. And then from that, um, you spin off um, all the appropriate um, mathematical ideas and constructs and descriptions that would that, that would that would attend that um, i mean it may be best to um reflect the question back to you so uh, this is a really neat idea having having an ontology um and it's certainly my experience that people are entertained by um sometimes the poetic use of phrases and descriptions such as um epistemic affordance when, when trying to grapple with you know, what what are the fundamental ideas behind active inference some of them are fundamental and some of them are not so it's uh, it certainly is an interesting idea to try and tie down uh, the ontology but let me let me ask you uh, you your uh, this ontology just means what it says in the sense that you're trying to define the essential concepts and how they relate to each other is, is that is that the basic idea yep Going back to this slide here, we want to have a continuum from a list of terms, potentially that could be developed into coherent and again, principled course material and competencies, but also develop a logic. And we're developing within the SUMO ontology development framework, which defines not just relational edges, but actually a actual logic. And so we hope to be able to ask, like, is this a complete active inference model? Do, have we really checked off all the boxes and use those kinds of logical tools that are accessible to the well-developed ontological frameworks? Okay, well, that, that's very compelling and um, very clear. Um, it strikes me then that you, you know, it would be useful to link that operational ontology to the underlying maths. So, um, you know, much of the much of the conceptual steps both in understanding and implementing um active inference usually in terms of simulating you know interesting behavior or um using it as an observation model to explain some empirical uh, data from from a study much of it um can be developed in terms of a series of moves um that usually uh, or in fact almost universally are um um inherit from the are framed in terms of um either information theory or linear algebra or um differential equations and you can just build the story from that so um if you're looking for that degree of formal and useful um uh, detail um then it would be one principle you might refer to is basically what your where where does one 
equality assertion or description or variable or, or um, object? Where does it come from in terms of inheriting from the, the, the more basic formalism? So what I'm thinking of here um, is where does active inference start and how do you get to the calculus and um, the Bayesian mechanics that you would you'd, you'd associate with, with active inference? And my guess is, given the structure or the way that you have um, approached the ontology, you've, you've probably actually done that already or are in the process of doing that. Maybe, yeah, are you going to go through some examples that, that would sort of highlight the, the, you know, the strategy and the, um, and the problems, which are usually more illuminating than the solutions uh, that you've encountered so far? Sure, I'll switch here to this screenshot of the, the current state of what it looks like. And we're starting just in tabular form by compiling up to five references and citable definitions. First, just looking for exact cases where a term is used. And then we'll go from how the term has been used towards synthetic definitions that capture different senses of the term. And then along with the concise narrative of the field and also um, ontology experts who are here with us, we're going to then be working to make the actual logical underpinnings elucidated in terms of specifiable code rather than just concise English definitions. And then from that sort of generator of the formal relationships, we'll be able to descend into mathematical formalisms or other natural human languages. Yeah. We'll, we'll keep you posted on this project though, for sure. Let's go to this next question and imagine that we had that set of terms in development. It's going to be a work in progress our whole lives. How would we go from core terms and ideas to an interactive and enlivening education that speaks to people from many different backgrounds? So I, I'm going to answer this question from the point of view of my experience um, as a supervisor, which is probably a little bit of, narrow, of a narrow remit from uh, your more general ambition. Uh, and I imagine that this is uh, related to this notion of, was it sort of um, research debt? I can't remember now, but this notion that you don't want to put too much pressure on people. Um, when becoming acquainted with the utility and application of, um, of either the code or, or, or the ideas. So um, in my experience with um, in an academic setting, uh, just having toy simulations is usually the best way to give people a feel for um, what these uh, what this approach does and how it can be used. So um, it's you're know, enormously potent in terms of demystifying and also illustrating the functionality at hand or that can be accessed. Um, it also ha having a sort of um, you know a, a working um, a working or at least a toy model um, sort of provides a proof of principle. Um, that can um, strip away the magic as well, and I think your your uh, your your ambition to try and make this accessible to people who are not necessarily fluent in the underlying information theory or dynamical systems is is very laudable and perfectly feasible. So uh, again, in my experience, you, you, some of the most um, creative applications of active inference are can be by people who don't really necessarily wonder too much what's underneath the hood. Um, it all comes back again to the design of the generative model. So if you get the, if you get the generative model right, um, and it's apt to describe the thing that you want to understand or to simulate, um, then uh, usually everything else follows, uh, follows suit. And I mean that in the sense that you can just take off the shelf software, which I presume that you, you know, your ultimate ambition is to make available um, and make it work in the service of sort of saying, well, what would this agent or this uh, synthetic creature or person um, do in exchange with um, her environment if 
this was the generative model and this was the generative process. So a lot of this, um, a lot of this really, I imagine in terms of answering your question, how do we go from core terms to interactive and enlivening education is just establishing a language, a lexicon that allows you to talk through somebody in constructing their own um, simulations that speak to the issues that engage them um, either academically or, be, or, be, or beyond academia. Um, so um, clearly then the core terms play the role of uh, literally a language in terms of communication, which brings us back again to the, you know, the importance of the ontology um, and having the terms um, linked in a formal way to the, uh, the, you know, the, the the mathematical expressions and also procedures and processes. Um, you, you know, so I guess that a precondition to do the uh, to use the core terms in an interactive and enlivening educative sense will rest upon getting that getting that ontology right. In my experience, you know, the, the the best way to get the ontology right in the sense of it being enabling. Um, is just to talk about the terms and, until everybody, until there's some consensus and everybody understands them in terms of either their teleology, well, sorry, no, in, both in terms of their teleology, but also in terms of where they come from in, uh, from the point of view of the code and ultimately the maths that under, underwrites all this. Is that the sort of um, answer you're looking for here or thinking along, with, are you thinking along the same lines? It sounds great. There's so many dimensions there. Just to provide a summary or just jump in at one place, what is active inference and what does active inference do? Right. So that's perfect because I was just thinking it would be really useful just to go down the sort of the, the terms that you had in the um, in the um, Previous but one slide highlighted in green because I think you know all the heavy lifting here is is really just shouting about um, what what are the core um, aspects and claims or um, the thing the, the core things that you're trying to communicate with um, any one of those terms. So for me, active inference um, would um, be a description of a process. Um, that can be seen as something that arises from the free energy principle. So you can either um, tell that story from the point of view of a physicist and um, say that active inference um, is a teleological description of uh, processes that systems that self-organize must possess, or you could tell the story or define active inference from um, the point of view of neurobiology and ethology, um, you know, from the point of view of, say, predictive processing, and describes what what it entails. Um, and I've used the word basic mechanics before because, um, from the point of view of the you know the physics definition, it would be um, a teleological description of a basic mechanics that necessarily arises. Um, or, you know, with some certain with certain assumptions from any self-organizing system. Um, one key thing about active inference, which um, I think would be important to put in the definition in the ontology, I'm not sure it's it's already there, but you know, if you're in charge of sculpting that ontology, um, then you're in the position to make sure it's there. Um, is it, 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 it's about uh, it's beyond predictive. Um, processing. It's beyond sentience and it emphasizes um, or reflects the pragmatic turn at the beginning of this century, really, um, sort of epitomized by the sort of the four E's, you know, embodied, um, embedded, um, um, extended, and the like, um, to make it clear that sentience is, is active and that you are talking about, uh, you know, um, the circular causality of engagement of any um, particle, person, or plant with whatever is out there. So that would be certainly one thing um, 
to, to emphasize in terms of the you know, what active inference means. The inference um, is interesting in the sense that it, it does imply uh, a process and, um, and a, a process with purpose, which is to infer, um, which is why I keep using the word, you know, the, a teleological description of something that's actually underneath the hood from the point of view of physics. Uh, one final point here is um, there's an easy confusion, I think, uh, and, um, between, first of all, active inference and passive inference. So that's certainly something which probably needs resolving, certainly in the philosophical literature. So I often come across um, the you know, uh, philosophers who say, well, there's, there's passive uh, inference or perceptual inference, which is just basically inferring uh, states of affairs in the world. Um, on the basis of some sensory um, evidence. Um, and then there's the extra bit, which is the active bit, which is now you're in charge of gathering that sensory evidence upon which you are now going to um, prosecute your perceptual inference. That, that, that's an interesting um, dichotomy, which I'm not sure is, you know, um, is, the, is, a, is a correct um, um, dichotomy. Um, um, if it's not right, I'm not sure that it is not right in the sense that, that it is a, a useful distinction, but certainly is not what active inference was originally um, um, termed to mean. It, you know, by conjoining active and inference, there were a number of motivations. First, it was a generalization of David McKay's active learning. Um, but probably um, more importantly, it was it was a nod to the notion of active sensing and active um, and, you know, active perception that perception is in and of itself an um, an active process a constructive process that you have to put um, policies plans and action into the game so that I think would be one important um, aspect of active inference to, to to define and I don't know that it has been defined so far so you know perhaps it's your job to to, to define that. The other thing which is um, important, I think, in terms of emphasizing what um, active inference entails um, actually comes from that inactive perspective, which is inference about the consequences of action. And that has an important but really simple um, um, concomitant that the consequences of action are in the future. Um, and that means you now have to think, if you're thinking from uh, uh, about active inference um, in terms of, of teleology or as a normative um, theory of, of behavior, of sentient behavior, um, you have to now think about, I'm sorry, and I should say, uh, qualify, when I say normative, I mean it can be operationally defined in terms of, of, of as an optimization process that in turn uh, requires you to define the objective function or functional. Um, and that's important practically, because if you're now thinking about sentient behavior or active inference, and it's inference about things that not, haven't yet happened because you haven't yet acted, um, then you're necessarily talking about um, objective functions or functionals that are about states of affairs in the future. And that is an important move um, and something that active inference embraces, which goes beyond predictive coding. So much of the literature in the 20th, you know, in the 1990s, and, um, you know, and subsequent, uh, much of the literature that inspired that sort of inactive perception or active sensing take situated cognition um, take on um, on sentience um, originated in you know, in things like predictive coding but predictive coding is not what is meant by active inference you can do predictive coding just by um, if you're a statistician just minimizing variational free energy um, that, that that that's only um, half the game once you move into the world of active inference from a teleological perspective all your you are you, you have to do that you have to um, form beliefs about hidden states of affairs in the world um, using sort of the perceptual side of perceptual inference but that is only in the service of rolling out into the future um, and deciding what the best thing is to do next and that rolling out into the future 
and deciding clearly calls for an objective function. So in active inference, that would be the expected free energy, which may or may not be unfortunately named, but that's that's what it is. Um, um, and therefore, active inference sort of implies that you are committed to optimizing an expected free energy. And implicitly, it's all about choosing the next thing to do. Um, so for me, those would be two would be two sort of cardinal things that should be embraced by definition of active inference that you know transcend other normative uh, approaches. So, for example, re, you know reinforcement learning in behavioral psychology um, would be all about what the good things are to do, and you commit to a, a loss function or a, a value function of states. Um, you know, if, if that was the you know, um, the, the kind of behavior that you're trying to describe. If on the other hand, you are all about the psychophysics of perception or just building face or digit or terrorist recognition systems where you weren't in charge of gathering those data, then your objective functions would be would be very, very different. Um, but what active inference says is, well, you can't, you can't carve up the two problem domains because they're just both sides of the, of the same coin. And thereby, you're, you know, you're now facing the problem of defining an objective function that is fit for purpose, that does both um, um, uh, the belief updating about um, latent states or hidden states um, generating the data, and also the best way to um, uh, solicit, solicit or cause those data or outcomes under some prior preferences or some goal-directed uh, constraints. Is that a good long-winded answer? Thank you for the comprehensive answer. It leads directly to our next questions, which are, what is the free energy principle? And especially, what is the relationship between active inference and the free energy principle? Right, well, that, that, that's, um, that's, I think, a slightly easier question to, <laughs> to, to answer. I mean, the free energy principle um, is um, just a variational principle of least action. Um, it um, why is it special or not uh, um, um, formally identical to all the other variational principles that we use in um, you know, in, in, if you look under the hood um, right from quantum through um, statistical and stochastic um, to classical mechanics well the, the only thing that differentiates really the, the variational um, uh, principle of least action that is the uh, or um, that is the free energy principle is that you're paying careful attention to the separation of states to which you apply that principle, um, the separation of states into the states of a an agent or a particle or a, part, a, a person and and the outside states. So technically, um, if you were in statistical thermodynamics, for example, you'd normally assume that separation in terms of some idealized gas that was contained within the container or heat reservoir or, or a heat bath without really worrying about where the heat bath or the, um, the, um, the heat reservoir came from. But the free energy principle says, well, no, you can't really do that. You've really got to attend very carefully to, the, to what um, licenses a separation of different kinds of states that you can assign to the inside of something and the outside of something and the states that mediate the exchange between the inside and the outside outside and then you get into the markov blanket and markov boundary literature so just to summarize the free energy principle is just a um, a principle of least action by which i mean that there is a description of dynamics in terms of the most likely paths any system will take that is um, the special provenance of um, a partitioning or a separation of the states of some uh, universe into the states that are owned by an agent or a particle and those that are not, and the states that mediate the exchange be between them. So that would be the free energy principle. Um, active inference, as I say, is a sort of um, teleological spin-off from um, the, uh, the the free energy principle in the sense that um, in the same sense that you have now at hand a principle of least action um, 
uh, you know, the, it allows you to um, identify, simulate, define the paths or trajectories or the narratives that a system, the most likely paths, trajectories or narratives that a system will pursue under certain conditions. And those conditions are just that there is an attracting set of states um, to which that uh, system um, um, will um, will converge to or uh, will look as if it's attracted to. Um, so, sorry, what I was working towards was the notion of um, um, an attracting set as a metaphor for equipping that physics with a teleology. And that teleology is nicely illustrated by the notion of attraction. So, you know, when mathematicians talk about attractors, in the uh, particular case in the free energy principle, these are these are sort of pullback attractors or the, the kind of attractors that you get in random dynamical systems. Um, um, the, 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 there's a, a, a proper and natural tendency to think that these particular states um, of the attracting set literally attract in the sense of a, you know um, gravitational attraction or any other kind of attraction. They pull. Um, um, uh, and the, 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 they pull states towards them. So that, to me, would be a teleological uh, interpretation, which I think is much closer to active inference, that you're saying that inference is a process that has a purpose, and the underlying free energy principle looks uh, allows you to say that when it looks as if self-organizing systems uh, show these certain properties, they're attracted to certain states, they show... Um, that, you know, they're attracted to certain paths, and we can describe those uh, in terms of the teleological ontology, and that would be active inference. Um, one practical difference between active inference and the free energy principle is that the free energy principle is just a principle. It's neither right nor wrong. It's just like um, um, uh, um, as Baron Millage has uh, noted, it's like sort of uh, Nother's theorem or your um, or Hamilton's principle of least action. Um, but as soon as you start to say, well, I think that this principle applies to this population or person or particle, um, that suddenly commits you or requires you to define a um, a the, the attracting set of states, a pullback attractor um, in, in another jargon, the equivalent uh, would be a generative model. And as soon as you commit to a generative model to explain the teleology of this system or this agent or this person, um, then you've moved into the world of non-falsifiable principles, into falsifiable hypotheses, because you could have chosen the wrong generative model. And thereby, there will be evidence for choosing this generative model or that generative model. So. Um, the relationship between active inference and the free energy principle is operationally quite simple. You know, active inference is the application of the free energy principle to a particular system. But in that application, you're bringing a lot of teleology to the table. Uh, and more specifically, um, um, having, you're having to commit to a particular generative model. And as soon as you do that, that becomes your theory or your hypothesis about what is an app description yeah, for this system. So a number of, I think, sort of interesting distinctions in terms of the relationship between active inference and free energy principle that I imagine um, your ontology has already addressed or it's certainly, it's certainly addressing. Well, we'll get there. Thank you for that excellent answer. For the next question, Lorena, please read it out. Oh, hi. So still in the spirit of uh broad questions and broad terms uh, and that I think comes in line what came before so how and where does the idea of information play a role in the free energy principle and how does it relate with active inference in the sense what is something to keep in mind when thinking about information dynamics in active inference Right, well, these are great questions. I'm getting the hang of this now. You, you just want me to talk. <laughs> You'll present a question to a lot of talking, which is which I'm very happy to do. Um, uh, are you sure you want me to do that, uh, or should this be a conversation? Perhaps it will turn into a conversation at some point. Anyway, so uh, information. So it plays um, an, a dual role. Um, um, 
in the sense that information theoretic formulations underpin most of the derivations behind that principle of least action. And, and it can be no other way in the sense that all mechanics uh, from physics is really articulated in terms of probability densities or distributions. Um, and as soon as you um, have a mechanics that is, um, um, or a calculus of probability distributions, you're effectively in the world of information theory. And you see that at many different um, levels. So uh, one nice example of this is that the, um, the central um, um, quantity um, that we often use to score the likelihood of being in a particular state. Um, uh, if you're a statistician, that would be the marginal likelihood. Um, if you, um, you know, were fluent um, with, with, with a, an FEP ontology, it would be surprisal, uh, or more simply surprise. Um, if that is just basically the self-information, it's um, if you're a physicist, you'd look at this as a potential, it's a, a negative log probability. So the, you you start really um, when thinking about the physics with this um, central concept of self-information, which the RAP can be read as um, a potential function or a surprisal function or surprise, and it is the thing that the variational free energy is a, a bound approximation to. So at that level, and then everything else, every other move you make mathematically in terms of um, uh, the expected self-information being um, the entropy and you know why that is important as a characterization of various probability distributions in the setting of self-organization. Um, and you know, um, would testify to the fact that information theory is absolutely central to all the maths that underlies the, the, the physics of the sentience that emerges from um, having a distinction between the states of a system and states that are not of the system, namely the Markov blanket. Having said that, I think information um, to most people's minds um, usually means more, certainly in the, in the folk psychology uh, context. It's really information about something. Um, and the um, FEP active inference has, I think, something quite special to the bring to the table here that goes beyond um, information theoretic treatments of, uh, you, you know, that you get in communication and signal processing and rate distortion theorems, all of that kind of information is just um, um, your extensions of information theory that inherit from self-information or the implausibility of a particular event or message. That would, uh, you know, uh, or in your know, more abstract domains such as sentience and consciousness, you would go to something like integrated information theory. But that is all about this um, Shannon-esque kind of information. The opposite, the other kind of information, which is information about something. So what I wanted to try and uh, put on the table is the very fact that you've got this Markov blanket or separation of um, states on the inside and states on the outside means that now you can equip the states on the inside with the role of encoding posterior or conditional Bayesian beliefs about states on the outside. And that introduces um, technically a different kind of information geometry, a different kind of information theory, uh, where crucially now you can read the internal dynamics as um, containing or having information about what's going on on the outside. And this is an, a really important move, equipping um, your neuronal dynamics or variational message passing or belief propagation in a computer with an information geometry that now allows you to read off the state of the computer or the state of the neural activity um, in terms of what it is encoding or believe or the information it contains about the outside. And so that 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 sort of dual aspect information geometry has been celebrated um, to a minor extent in the philosophy literature by Vanya um, Weiss, um, you know, asking the question is, you know, is this really the maths of sentience where you now have information 
um, about things. And in a sense that you know, that really is the heart of the free energy principle in the sense, or active inference anyway, in the sense that it equips um, that dual, um, that information geometry. I mean, technically what you are saying is that um, any particular internal state of a computer or a person or a brain now can be read as encoding a Bayesian or a posterior belief about um, other states, namely hidden or latent causes um, outside the Markov blanket. And that defines technically something called a statistical manifold. And as soon as there is a, statist a statistical manifold, there's an information geometry. And any movement on that manifold necessarily implies a change in your Bayesian beliefs, namely Bayesian belief updating, um, which means now there's a um, an interpretation of neuronal dynamics, movements on a statistical manifold on the inside in terms of belief updating. So the, the notion of active inference as the process of belief updating really um, you know, rests upon this fundamental notion that there's information about stuff going on, um, about stuff that is encoded or uh, parameterized by the um, by the internal machinations and the mechanics and the dynamics of, of the inside. So I think it might be quite important to, if you're trying to describe or educate um, um, people in terms of how they should understand information um, as playing a central role in sentience, I think it'd be important to differentiate between the, um, the mathematical notions of Shannon information and self-information and the calculus of probability um, and neutral information, for example, and say that this is not the kind of information that is implicit in an information geometry and the sentience that is afforded by active inference, when now you're understanding neuronal dynamics or message passing in a computer on, on some um, um, phony, uh, on some sort of um, um, factor graph. Um, uh, because in this instance, each of those messages or that neur those neural dynamics um, can now be read as belief updating, namely changing your mind um, about um, other things so that the stuff on the inside has information about stuff on the outside. Thanks for this important answer. And we're going to pass over a few questions and go to 18 with Stephen reading the question to continue on this theme about the separation of the inside and the outside. So thank you, Stephen, and please read off 18. Uh, thank you. Um, I was going to ask, how can the integrity of the active inference process theory be maintained when blankets, blanket states and generative models are being interpreted in, in novel ways. So we were thinking about um, what do you think of discussions around Markov or Pearl, Friston blankets, etc. Right, that, that's an excellent question. I mean, I have a quite a technical answer. Um, so if if it's getting too technical, tell me. Now. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and get back to what the, you know, um, what what you what you um, uh, were really trying to unearth. Um, so you know, uh, th th this is a, um, not a fast moving field, but certainly been a, a delicate and important um, area of discussion over the past few years. So in the original introduction of Markov blankets, there was um, um, an explicit nod to um, Pearl's construction of Markov blankets and how Markov blankets are used practically in terms of um, simplifying message passing um, in, in, in computer science. Um, however, that may have been um, something of an oversimplification um, because the, the, from the point of view of the free energy principle, um, it is um, the, the kind of causality that the, uh, the free energy principle deals with is not the kind of causality that um, people, uh, the, uh, particularly people like Pearl, but also people dealing with things like Granger causality um, deal with. Um, so we're not, we're, we, from the point of view of the free energy principle, that starts with um, 
a, a, a stochastic differential equation or a random dynamical uh, system written as a random dynamical equation. Um, OU processes being simple examples. Uh, in physics, these would be Langevin-like uh, equations. Common to all of these starting points is time and evolution and dynamics. Now, there is nothing in Pearl's formulations, well, certainly there's nothing in Pearl's book on causality that deals with time. Um, and I know that because uh, before the days of PDFs and uh, um, being able to go and um, search particular words, I had to go through and find out there's, there's one paragraph that, that mentions dynamics. Um, so, you know, if you were in, in, in statistics, computer science, you know, these, this will be the world of dynamic Bayesian nets. Um, the, 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 is, is their take on something which is actually much more universal, which is, is basically um, the universe as a Markovian dynamical process. So the, just stepping back, the, 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 the challenge now is to um, articulate um, independence, uh, independences that um, underwrite um, Markov blankets in the sense of Pearl um, in terms of dynamics. So you've now got to um, um, link two quite distinct fields, which is basically the fields of dynamics and launch van processes, um, things that have um, paths of least action, to the world of statistics and um, Pearl-esque um, independences um, and causality cast as interventions that have observable consequences. The, the problem in doing that linking is that you have to um, really abandon the notion of causality in the world of Granger causality and Pearl, because causality is baked into and is inherent in writing down any um, uh, differential equation, be it stochastic or random or deterministic, in the sense that states cause motion. So the causality in this context would be a more controlled theoretic causality. So um, that means that, that you can't then use the causality concept later on, but it does mean that you've now got to um, derive from a dynamical Markovian calculus um, the, um, the necessary um, conditions that would lead to um, the conditional independences that are necessary to define Markov boundaries. Um, just to slip in here, um, the, the Markov blanket um, um, is, um, if you, uh, is composed of minimal blankets, namely uh, boundaries in the sense of Pearl. Um, and on most recent analyses, it, it looks as if the blanket is actually two Markov boundaries um, uh, in the sense of Pearl. But to get to the sense of Pearl, you've got to think very carefully about what are the constraints that um, lead to the, um, the conditional independences where those constraints are specified in terms of equations of motion um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, and things like the amplitude of random fluctuations. So once you've, um, once you've seen that that is the, the link that needs to be made, that actually um, simplifies the thing. Uh, in, in, it simplifies things in the sense there's no real attitude for interpretation. So I'm going back to your the part of your question. You know, blankets and generative models are being interpreted in novel ways. And I, I don't think there's any latitude or for any novel interpretation other than the, the um, sorry. If in novel ways you mean the best way. Uh, or the correct way, and we just haven't got there yet, then I would, uh, you know, I'd concur entirely with that. If you think that there is some latitude, there's some library of um, insightful reinterpretations and redefinitions, uh, all of which have equal veracity, then I, I would suggest that's not the case. There's only one way, um, there's only one Markov blanket, um, or there's only one particular partition um, that will give you that, that, that can be articulated in terms of uh, Markov blankets, um, and the only novelness there is really in tying down very uh, precisely and um, um, and um, defensively how you get from a Langevin formulation to a Markov blanket, 
um, at the moment, the novel way of doing that um, um, looks as if it's a uh, <clears throat> That the conditional independences arise from sparse dynamical coupling or causal coupling. So, if you read um, the uh, the causality as um, the influence that a state has on the motion of itself or any other state in this sort of um, minimal Langevin-like uh, description of the universe, um, then it is the sparsity of influence or the sparsity of coupling that leads to conditional independences. And if a system has um, a sufficiently rich sparsity of conditional independences and implicitly coupling, then it will have a particular petition. And if it has that particular petition, then the uh, then the free energy principle holds. So um, I think the discussions around Markov, Pearl, Friston and Blankets are uh, essential. They're fascinating. Um, the conclusions of those discussions that I think are going to probably um, have to refer back to the underlying maths. And that maths is all about connecting Langevin formulations of physics to the kind of um, calculus that Pearl um, has established um, for, you know, um, in, in, a, in a more statistical sense. Thank you for the educational answer. This brings us almost to the end of the .edu section. So I will pass to the final question to be read by Dean, who had several excellent points and questions. So Dean, feel free to ask however you would like. Uh, good morning. Uh, so the question is, what's the difference between a subject matter expert and a predi uh, prediction matter expert? And how does this relate to your mode of interaction? You're going to have to unpack it, um, what subject and prediction matter experts um, means for me. Yeah. So for me, interesting, you become a subject matter expert by gaining a certain amount of concentration in a, in a particular field or area, and you become a prediction matter expert when you are able to think more distributively, more dispersively. And so I think what when I read some of the things and, and listen to some of the stuff that I've heard you talk about, you, you've brought these two worlds together. And so I'm kind of interested in, in hearing what you think in terms of introducing some of the, the ideas and principles that you brought into a world where traditionally we focused on concentrating, whether it's materializing something from an engineering perspective or deciding what's in and what's out, you've brought in another aspect to look at. And I'm, I'm just curious what you think of that. Okay, that's a fascinating um, distinction. I mean, you, you know, I, I'm not sure it's terribly important what I think about it, because clearly you're the expert on this, but it certainly would be fascinating to consider um, the conditions under which you were able to simulate the emergence of a subject matter versus a prediction matter expert in, in silico, for example, um, just as a proof of principle that these are both um, uh, effectively Bayes optimal ways of responding to a particular environment. And my guess is that you, you would um, be able to do that relatively easily uh, by appealing to the ideas that you find in um, 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 applying some of active inference notions to um, structure learning and development, um, where the basic idea is if you've got a very volatile environment, by which I mean that there are um, there's lots of uncertainty in um, the contingencies, or possibly there are lots of random fluctuations um, that are irreducible in terms of your your ability to, to predict um, the the outcome or the trajectory of latent states of the world in which you are becoming an expert. Then you, um, when you parameterize your uncertainty, in, 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 you're usually um, formally in terms of the precision of various likelihood mappings or. Uh, probability transition um, matrices in a sort of discrete state space generative models. 
when you parameterize your beliefs about the, that, the, that uncertainty, um, irreducible uncertainty um, and um, volatility, then agents that believe or have inferred that they are in a very volatile, changeable, capricious world usually become better at, pre at the prediction uh, um, side of things in the sense that they um, rely less upon um, deep past experience and uh, assign more precision or um, more potency to um, the more recent evidence. So they have a different style of evidence accumulation that enables, uh, and also they have the right level of uncertainty about what will happen next. So it looks as if in their um, predictive engagement um, and epistemic foraging in that world, it looks as if they are better at predicting changes because they're not committed to a particular uh, a particular um, explanation or understanding of how their world works. On the other hand, if you um, create a, a world um, which is incredibly predictable and learnable, then over time, the natural pressure to minimize um, free energy um, translates into um, um, a, a pressure to minimize complexity, namely a, a way of um, modeling your world and your exchange with it in the simplest way possible in accord with Occam's principle. And what that lends, you know, leads to is somebody, it sounds as if it's somebody who becomes a subject matter expert. But so the subject matter is their lived world that has now uh, become so predictable that they um, do not entertain all possible other outcomes because they have precise beliefs about the way that things will un unfold. And they can make very wise, very, parsimonious or using parsimonious degrees of freedom they can make um, they can make moves and become very expert in the way that this particular non-volatile predictable i.e precise world works and the, the link with aging here is that um, if you allow for the fact that we create our own environments and you're know, at many levels active inference will um, permit or is a way of framing our eco niche construction what tends to you know, what what people the story people tend to tell is that as you get older you basically make your world more predictable and you become a subject matter expert in your own lived world so i like the example i, I no longer go bungee jumping or go to discos because my world is very very predictable and I'm, I, I, you're very much an expert in it because my world is basically my conservatory and my study and my bedroom so I, I'm a complete ex subject expert on that. You take me out on, you know, to a disco, and I will not, I will not be able to predict what's going to happen next uh, because I'm old. Whereas, you know, adolescents and children, and certainly, uh, you know, newborn infants or newborn artifacts discovering their world, which is full of uncertainty, and they are not yet subject experts, and 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 the you know, the epistemic pressures or motivation for them to um, learn about you know what happens if I do that, um, and what can I control and what can't I control. That will make them very quickly into prediction experts until they become, until they become um, sufficiently fluent that they can now um, engineer their world to make it non-volatile, and then they presumably will become subject matter experts. So yeah, I'm sure that would be that would be fairly simple to simulate using you know all the sort of toy active inference um, schemes that we currently currently use. And it would be really interesting if these two different kinds of um, synthetic agents did develop sort of cognitive styles and confidence in what they were doing that looked exactly like the distinction you're talking about. I'm not sure it would work, but if it does, that, that would be, uh, you know, I think an illuminating uh, um, proof of principle. Thanks for this answer and for this session from the lab and .edu. That last answer really spoke to the importance also of intergenerational learning. At this point, we will take a five minute break and we will return for .coms. So thanks again, and we'll see everybody in five minutes right here.